Yes, Ms Hall. Commissioner, the next witness is Mr David Carter from Suncorp. Yes. Mr Carter, if you'd come into the witness box, can I ask you, Mr Carter, uh, whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Uh, affirmation, please. Yes, affirm the witness, please. I solemnly and sincerely... I solemnly and sincerely... Declare and affirm... Declare and affirm... That the evidence I shall give... That the evidence I shall give will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr. Carter. Yes, Ms. Mitchum. Well, your full name is David Anthony Carter. That's correct. Uh, and your business address is 266 George Street, Brisbane, in the state of Queensland. That's correct. Your current position is Chief Executive Officer, Banking and Wealth at Suncorp Group. Yes. Uh, Mr Carter, you've received a summons to appear at the Commission today. Yes. Uh, do you have a copy of the summons with you? Yes, I do. Commissioner, I tender the summons. Uh, exhibit 3.74, summons to Mr Carter. Uh, Mr Carter, have you prepared a witness statement in relation to a request for evidence regarding rubric 3-21? Yes, I have. Uh, do you have the original statement there with you? Yes, I do. Uh, and the exhibits to that statement? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr Carter, is your statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, I tender the statement. Exhibit 3.75, statement of Mr Carter relating to rubric 3-21 and its exhibits. Commission pleases. Thank you. Yes, Ms Orr. Mr Carter, you're the Chief Executive Officer for Banking and Wealth at Suncorp Group. Yes, I am. And you've been in that role since September 2016? Yes. And before that, you were the CFO of Banking and Wealth, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and you are the person with primary responsibility for the management of Suncorp Metway Limited? That's correct. And that company is the banking entity within the Suncorp Group? That's correct. Uh, and you've been put forward by Suncorp to give evidence about Suncorp's business lending and about loans entered into with Jennifer and Peter Lowe? Yes, I have. You've heard the evidence given uh, earlier today by Mr Ryan Lowe? Yes, I did. Thank you. Uh, now, prior to making your statement, you were provided with an outline of proposed evidence from Ryan Lowe and his mother, Jennifer Lowe. Is that right? Yes, I was. And you read those outlines? Yes. And you responded to the content of those outlines in your statement? Correct. Uh, now, uh, because Ms Lowe, um, Ms Jennifer Lowe, has not given evidence, I wish to tender uh, her outline of evidence which you responded to in your statement. That is RCD 0024 0010 0001. Exhibit 3.76 will be outline of evidence of Jennifer Lowe. RCD 0024 0010 0001. And I will also tender the outline of evidence of Mr Ryan Lowe, which you also responded to in your statement. Yes. That's RCD 0024 0010 0003. Outline of evidence of Ryan Lowe. RCD 0024-0010-003 becomes Exhibit 3.77. Um, Mr Carter, in 2013, Suncorp granted four loans to Peter and Jennifer Lowe. That's correct. Uh, and one of those loans was a business loan. I believe so, yes. And another was a business overdraft. Yes. For $200,000. Yes. <laughs> And the $200,000 overdraft was sought to fund construction of a factory on land uh, owned by Mr and Mrs Lowe through their self-managed superannuation fund. Yes. Uh, and Mr Lowe, Mr Peter Lowe, uh, told Suncorp at that time that he could complete the construction of the factory for $200,000 <coughs> or possibly for less than that amount. Yes. And that's why Mr Lowe wanted a line of credit or an overdraft rather than a business loan, because he expected that the funds required for completion were not going to reach $200,000, and he wanted to avoid payment on the full $200,000 of interest, if possible. Yes, yeah, that's the notes we have yes. on, on the record, yes. Yes, that's what the internal notes yes. reveal, yes. Uh, and the bank asked Mr Lowe 
uh, for the expected costs uh, to completion of the factory. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, Mr Lowe provided an itemisation of the construction costs? Yes. And based on that itemisation and um, other information provided by Mr Lowe, um, that loan or that line of credit or overdraft, I should say, was approved? Yes. Thank you. And then in 2014, Suncorp granted Mr and Mrs Lowe a further business loan? That's correct. And that was for another $240,000? Yes. And that's the loan that we've been referring to as business loan B? That's correct. And uh, the documents um, annexed to your statement show us that at the time Mr Lowe um, was given business loan B, he was about 62 years old? Yes. Okay. Now, there were two purposes for that loan, uh, as shown from the application documents, is that right? That's right. Uh, and the first was the same purpose as the 2013 overdraft. It was to complete construction of the factory on the property. Yes, it was to complete construction, yes, for $140,000. That's right. So mm -hmm. of the 240, mm -hmm. 140000 was sought for that purpose. Yes. And $100,000 was sought as working capital for the business. That's correct. Okay. Uh, now, that amount was advanced... Uh, to Mr Lowe, even though he told the bank the year before that he could complete the construction of the factory for 200000 or possibly less. That's correct. Um, now, FOS found that Suncorp had acted irresponsibly when it approved that loan. Yes, it did. Uh, and you've reviewed the files held by Suncorp in relation to those loans? I have. And on the basis of that review, you tell us in your statement that you agree with the findings of FOS about Business Loan B. Yes, I do. Okay. In your statement, you say that Business Loan B should not have been approved in the absence of a deeper exploration of the purpose for which the loan was sought. Is that right? That's right. And you say that Business Loan B was approved when it shouldn't have been because of a failure of the individuals involved in the approval process to carefully consider and validate the purpose to which business loan B would be applied? Yes. Do you accept that a diligent and prudent banker in assessing the application for business loan B would not have approved the loan without making further inquiries about the purpose for which it was sought? Um, this is a vexed issue, if I may just expand on this a little bit. So um, we have an existing customer whose repayments are in order uh, it is a loan that is well secured uh, and the initial inquiry into purpose I think was reasonable so we did inquire as to purpose. Uh, we asked for some evidence as to what the funds would be used for. However, and I had a relative advantage in reviewing the file compared to the assessor in that I just read the 2013 loan and went straight on to the 2014 loan so I of course had just seen the quote to complete uh, the building works in 13 so it was fresh in my mind. However, um, it did, whilst it is possible that there are overruns in a construction uh, project, it would have been better to have then asked why funds were being requested when the information provided, the quotes for the cladding and the excavation work, looked very similar to the amounts from the previous year. And therefore, I believe the banker or the assessor erred in not inquiring further as to purpose, having uh, initially inquired as to purpose, being provided with some information but not really then dug more thoroughly when the information appeared to be similar to what was on file the year before. Secondly, the working capital, it was not clear from the financial information provided as to why the working capital was necessary and that should have been explored further as well. You say you had an advantage because you had just read the 2013 file. That's correct. Would you expect the people involved in assessing and approving the 2014 loan to have also read the 2013 file? I think that would be best practice, yes. Yes. Um, and in that case, your advantage was really not material. You did what should have been done by the people assessing the 2014 loan. Uh, I think it's material in that I have spent uh, a complete focus on 13 and, and done the assessment on 13 first, so I have put more time to understand 13 first and then moved on to 14. Yes, but would you have expected the person assessing the 2014 loan to have done just that? I wouldn't have expected them to have assessed 13 as if it was fresh and brand new. No, I would have expected them to refer to 
the information, uh, but not to have completed a more thorough assessment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Even though that loan was only a year earlier? Yes. And it was another business loan sought for the same purpose? Yes. Um, I, I just want to come back to the question I asked you, which is whether or not you accept that a diligent and prudent banker in assessing that application for business loan B would not have approved it without making further inquiries about the purpose of the loan. I agree. Thank you. Uh, in your statement, you point to a number of specific failures by those at Suncorp involved in the approval of that loan. Uh, firstly, you say that they failed to inquire as to why the funds advanced in 2013 had been insufficient to complete the construction work for which they had been advanced. Yes. Uh, secondly, you say that they failed to compare the schedule of works that was provided by Mr Lowe in 2013 with the quotes that he provided in support of the 2014 application, which showed an overlap between the nature of the works that had already been funded and the works that were still to be done. Yes. Thirdly, you say they failed to ask for receipts for the work undertaken using the proceeds of the 2013 loan to confirm that those funds had been used in line with the schedule of works that was provided. Yes. And fourthly, you say they failed to inquire as to why Mr Lowe's business needed to borrow more money to provide funds for working capital in circumstances where the balance sheet for the business that was provided to the bank indicated that the business had current assets of approximately $130,000. Uh, yeah, well, the, it did, but there was no apparent need for working capital on the information provided, correct? Yes. And I think my statement says that it's and or to the, as to the purpose. Any one of those inquiries on the construction should have led people to the person to, um, to more deeply inquire as to purpose. Yes, you say in your statement that your view is that if those involved in approving the loan had taken any one or more of those steps, that would have caused further inquiries to be made about the purpose for the loan. Yes, is that right? Yes, that's correct. But none of those steps were taken? I can see no evidence of that on the file, no. Mm -hmm. uh, and did some corp ever work out what happened to the first $240,000 that was advanced to Mr Lowe in 2013? Uh, you mean the 200,000? Sorry. I'm sorry. The I don't two, mean to um, you. No, you're correct. Yeah, I okay. apologise, Mr. Carter. Yes. The 240 is the 2014 amount. Yeah. The 200,000 in 2013. Does no. Suncorp know what happened to that money? No. Okay. Well, sorry. Um, we did not know until the FOS complaint uh, came through uh, and also the hardship request where we started to. Uh, uh, it was apparent. It, was, it looked like the funds had not been used for the business, yes. and, and then we get to that stage, yes. Yes. And you accept that Suncorp acted irresponsibly in, proving, in approving business loan B? Yes. Okay. Now, that wasn't the view that Suncorp took during the course of the FOS proceeding, was it? Not through the first complaint, no. No. At, at no point during that first FOS proceeding did Suncorp acknowledge to FOS or to the Lowe's that it had acted irresponsibly in relation to business loan B? That's correct. And why did that happen, Mr Carter? Well, I think, as I said earlier, the um, this issue of purpose required a deeper level of examination. And uh, I think, again, when it was looked at as part of the FOS matter, uh, there was an insufficient examination of the purpose and the reconciliation between 2013 and 2014. So there was another set of errors uh, was in the FOS process in terms of, again, at that second stage, not looking properly at the purpose of the loan. Is that right? It's the same error repeated, yes. Yes, by a different uh, group of individuals. Is that right? I believe so. Yes. Could, could I just ask that you be shown uh, SUN 0603-0005-1647? Which tab is that? It's not Sorry. part of your statement. Okay. It'll, it'll come up on the screen, Mr Carter. Uh, so this is a letter sent by Suncorp to FOS on the 14th of June 2016. This is a letter that was sent after Mr Lowe lodged the first complaint about the five loans. And if we could have both that page and the second page on the screen. <coughs> we see on the first page 
um, in the second last paragraph, Suncorp maintains the respective credit assessments were sound and does not accept that there has been any maladministration. In each of the loan applications, Suncorp completed the relevant credit checks and serviceability calculations. Uh, so that was the position that Suncorp took in the dealings with FOS, is that right? Yes. Now, uh, this letter was written by the customer relations banker who's the subject of the non-publication direction, is that right? Yes, although if I may clarify, she's not a banker. She is an advisor in the group customer relations unit, which is independent of the banking team. What position title does she have? We, we've used the title that appeared in emails. Is that not the correct uh, I title? I think the title in emails is advisor, group customer relations unit, or could be or alternatively, Group Customer Relations Bank. Right. So I apologise so, for that. No, no, again. no, that's all right. What title should I use when referring to this person, Mr Carter? What would be a correct... I'm happy with Customer Relations uh, Banker or Advisor, just for continuity, yes. Yes, OK, thank you. Mm. Uh, now, did that person write this letter? I uh, believe so, yes. yes. I, I would have the final yeah, page right. brought on the screen to show you, but her name is redacted, so I, that I'm happy to assist. accept. Yes. yes. Um, and that person, uh, we assume, reviewed the file in relation to business loan B? Yeah, based on my investigations, she, she reviewed it alone, yes. As you have done in preparing for your statement? Yes. But your review led you to conclude that business loan B shouldn't have been approved for the reasons that um, we've discussed? Yes. Uh, but this person's review didn't lead her to form the same conclusion? Yes. And that's because I think your evidence is that she too did not pay adequate attention to the purpose of the loan application in 2014. I can find no evidence anywhere else to suggest the contrary, no. Okay, thank you. I tender this document, Commissioner. Letter Suncorp to FOS, 14 June 16, SUN 0603 005 1647, Exhibit 3.78. Now, before FOS made a final determination, it made a recommendation, is that right? That's correct. In December 2016? Yes. And that recommendation is exhibited to your statement. It's part of your Exhibit 26. Mm -hmm. It's SUN 0603 0004 1582. Now, could we turn to 1592 in that? Oh, I'm sorry, this is the determination. The recommendation appears behind that, I think, in your exhibit, I understand. Uh, Mr Carter. So the recommendation starts at 1592. And we see there the issues and key findings in the recommendation. Uh, we see that FOS found at this stage that the approval of business loan B was irresponsible, taking into account factors that include but are not limited to the factors that you've acknowledged in your evidence so far today. Yes. Um, now, they were the assessment of affordability, we see these at the bottom of the page. Your assessment of affordability was dependent on development of the commercial property to generate rental or sale income to repay the loan. That was the first factor that yep. FOS pointed to as to why this was an irresponsible loan. Secondly, the factor that you've pointed to, it did not make adequate inquiries in 2014 about the purpose of the additional request for funds or the status of construction on the commercial property. If we could have the second page brought up next to that. And had it done so, it would have found the borrowers had not used the business overdraft funds for construction as in intended. And the third reason FOS gave was that Suncorp did not control the use of the business loan B funds where it was prudent to do so to ensure completion of the commercial property. So three separate reasons given by FOS there as to why this was an irresponsible loan. Yes. Now, in your statement, you deal with the second of those and yes. you've given evidence about the second of those today. 
Do you accept that the first and the third were also reasons why this was an irresponsible loan? Uh, I, when I reviewed the 2014 file, I stopped after the purpose failed. I didn't spend a lot more time on the 2014 transaction, but the first point is not unreasonable. The third point, uh, I don't necessarily agree with Foz's view that those proceeds should have been controlled in that way. We did not have security over the commercial property. However, um, I'm happy to accept, well, I'll step back. Foz's answer is a good answer. I agree with the answer. I didn't see a benefit in um, you know, uh, further investigating uh, beyond that um, for the purpose of preparing for, for the hearing. And is that because, as I understand it, the primary failure that you have focused on is the second failure, the failure to make adequate inquiries about the purpose of the loan? Yes, as I said, when I went through the file consecutively, it stood out quickly. Yep. Yes. Uh, it stood out quickly to you, but it didn't stand out quickly to the person who was handling this on your behalf in FOS, did it? I can't speak for them, but it doesn't appear to have, no. Yes, thank you. And if, if we turn to 1596. <coughs> there we are. Um, we see at the bottom of that page that in considering whether Suncorp acted irresponsibly, FOS referred to the obligation of a lender at law and under the code of banking practice to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent lender in assessing whether a customer has the ability to repay a loan? Yes. And FOS went on to note, and we'll need the next page on the screen as well, that whilst the FSP, that Suncorp, uh, is not a subscriber to the code of banking practice, FOS considers that the code of banking practice represents good industry practice. Uh, is that incorrect? Is Suncorp in fact a subscriber to the code of banking practice? I believe so. Yes, thank you. And was at the time of this recommendation? Yes. Okay. Now at um, 1598, Foz noted uh, under the heading, did the FSP act irresponsibly, uh, third paragraph down, that Mr Lowe was about 62 years old when business loan B was approved and was the key person operating the business. The applicant did not work. In those circumstances, Suncorp was required to consider how they would repay the loans without substantial hardship after the applicant's late husband's retirement. Yes. Do you agree with that? Um, Was Suncorp required to consider that? Yes, we that? were. And did anyone consider that? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Uh, they go on at 1599. To a quite detailed consideration of Suncorp's conduct in approving the loan. Do you see that? And that continues over onto 1600. Yes. Have you read this before, yes. Mr Carter? And you'll see that the ultimate conclusion on 1600 in relation to the points that you've addressed in your statement is that if further inquiries had been made in 2014 about the status of the construction and purpose of the funds requested, it would likely have determined that the late applicant's late husband had not applied the 200,000 as intended. A prudent lender in these circumstances would not have provided an additional $240,000 without further inquiries. You accept that? Yes ensuring the funds provided would complete the construction as intended. Do you accept that? Yes. And controlling the use of the funds, such as via progress payments. Do you agree with that? As I said earlier, I don't necessarily agree with that point. Okay. I bet you agree that you did not do that. Suncorp did not do anything to control the use of the funds. No, it didn't. And that contributed to FOS's finding that this was an irresponsible loan. I accept that. Thank you. Now, the Lowe's rejected this recommendation. Yes. Uh, and therefore it proceeded to, to a determination. Yes. And before the determination 
uh, Suncorp put in further submissions about this? Yeah, Suncorp accepted the recommendation yes. and notified FOS quite early of that. Yes. Uh, we were then notified that the Lowe's were not accepting the recommendation and so uh, we chose to put in additional information, yes. Yes, so you chose to maintain your position which was that there had been no maladministration even though you'd seen the recommendation of FOS to the effect that there had been in the 2014 loan. Yes. And you put in further submissions <coughs> pressing even harder with that point, did you not, Mr Carter? Yes, we did. Yes. Uh, have you seen the material that was submitted in between the recommendation and the determination? Yes. Uh, do you think that material should have been put in? No. What's your view of that material, Mr Carter? I don't think it adds uh, to a conclusion that uh, business loan B was a better loan for the sake of that information. And can you explain to the Commission what that further information was that was put in after the recommendation and before the determination? I may not get it exactly, but I recall it as being a series of Google Maps photos showing the property at different stages of completion. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is at the time of the recommendation? At the time of the recommendation, not so, the time of the loan. So years after yeah, the well, loans have been granted? If my memory is correct, the first photo was prior to the loans. There's a photo around about the time of the loans and then a final photo which is quite proximate to the date of the uh, recommendation. And what was the submission that was put in connection with those photos? That the premises had moved from being relatively incomplete to, I think, something like 90% complete. Was the submission effectively that there was something um, misleading in the applicant's approach to FOS because the factory had indeed been completed? I don't recall the specifics without looking at it now, but it was that the funds were likely to have been used to do the work. Okay. At when? From uh, the, I think the contention in the, in the response was that it had been used post the granting of the loan based on the photos proximate to the recommendation? Well, again, my recollection is the photos, there are a series of photos. Uh, they're not, um, uh, you know, they're a couple of years apart, so somewhere between 2014 and 2017. Let's go to what Foz said about this in the determination, which is SUN 0603-0041582. And at 1591, I'm sorry, I've got that number incorrect, 1589. I'm sorry, I'll just make sure I have the right reference. If you'd just give me a moment, Mr Carter. Okay, so 1589, we see the heading, did the FSP act irresponsibly when it approved business loan B? Um, the FSP Suncorp says the applicant applied the loan funds to build the factories. Suncorp said in submissions dated 14 February 2017 that based on Google Earth photos of the commercial property dated February 2010, September 2014 and February 2017, it appears that the applicant's late husband did apply the loan proceeds from both business overdraft and the business loan B to complete the factories. The February 2017 photos indicate doors and entry of the building have yet to be completed. Um, however, Suncorp considers the factories to be over 90% complete. So that was the submission that was put by Suncorp uh, prior to the determination. Yes, I believe so. And FOS rejected that submission, didn't it? Yes. And FOS found that the photos didn't change the findings made in the recommendation because although some further work appeared to have been done on the factories, um, this had no bearing on whether the, the decision to approve business loan B back in June 2014 was irresponsible. I agree with FOS's findings. Yes. So. I should make clear, they said that while some further work appeared to have been done on the factories 
after September 2014. That had no bearing on whether approving the loan in June 2014 was irresponsible. I agree. Thank you. Now, the determination we see from 1590 was made by Mr Field, the Lead Ombudsman of Banking and Finance at FOS. Yes. Uh, and he found that the findings made by the FOS case officer in the earlier recommendation were correct. And I agree with that. Thank you. Now, before this FOS process commenced, uh, the Lowe's, um, as you heard from the evidence earlier, had sought hardship assistance from Suncorp in relation <coughs> to the loans. That's correct. Uh, and could I ask that you be shown the first exhibit to Mr Lowe's statement, which is SUN 0060192 at 0926. I'm sorry, at 1926. So that's the request for financial assistance. Yep. Have you looked at this form before? Yes, I have. Mr Carter, so you've seen the reasons that were given on the second page of why financial assistance was sought? Yes, I have. And you've heard the evidence about that earlier today? Yes, I have. You've heard that by this request, Mrs Lowe asked for 12 months uh, yes. to figure out how she could repay the loans? Yes. Uh, Mrs Lowe didn't ask the bank to forgive the loans, did she? No. Uh, she just wanted to postpone the repayments on the loans? That's correct. Uh, and you can see the deficit on this page in the weekly budget that was done. So uh, Mrs Lowe was $2,800 odd short uh, on a monthly basis. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so Mrs Lowe couldn't afford to make the loan repayments. That's correct. Uh, the bank considered this application for financial assistance? Yes. And you've annexed to your statement a document that records the internal consideration of this request for financial assistance, which is at Exhibit 28 of your statement, SUN 0603 0011 1194. You've seen this document before, yes, Mr Carter? And if we turn to 1195, we see the recommendation that was made by a person within Suncorp. This person notes Suncorp customer two years with good repayment history. Um, no previous hardship application. Mr Lowe died and wife is out of her depth in relation to financial situation and needs to obtain professional help. Consider 12 months requested is excessive but consider four month deferment on loans and capital arrears is reasonable time for her to obtain help required. Now that was the basis on which the decision was made to extend only a four month deferral on the loans. Uh, do you stand by this assessment of Mrs Lowe's financial assistance request? Yes, I do. And may I explain a little bit? Yes. Okay. So this is, uh, unfortunately people do, um, suffer from death or serious injury in a family or illness and uh, often we find that four months is about the right time for people to just get a base level of understanding of their position and then we tend to have a discussion about what to do next. Uh, the purpose of hardship is to support people where there are likely uh, prospects of being able to return the, the lending back into uh, you know, for what language we use in here, good standing, the ability to continue to service the debts. Um, the, by necessity, needs a finite period of time. It does get extended from time to time, uh, but that's why at four months, it allows people some time to gather some information together, uh, get a feel for where they sit and understand what the, whether there is the ability to return the lending to good standing over time or whether other decisions would need to be made. Did anyone tell uh, Mrs Lowe that this might be extended if she asked for it to be extended at the end of the four month period? I don't know. I haven't seen anything that says that. There's no evidence to suggest that Not anyone that I have told seen, her no. that. 
Um, so how was she meant to know that this was something that could be extended after a further discussion at the end of the twelve month, at the end of the four months? I don't know what was said at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so she asked for twelve months, and all that she's given is four months, and she's required to sign a document um, a, that accepting the offer that has been made. Um, do you think that she would have understood from that that four months was all that the bank was prepared to give her? Uh, I, I assume so. Are you saying the bank would have been prepared to give her more if she'd asked again? Again, the purpose of hardship is to um, provide people with some space while they understand what's happening. Um, it is not uncommon for hardship to be extended equally. Uh, there are situations where hardship cannot be extended because it is only prolonging a situation that cannot return to good standing. What, what, so it depends. What did Suncorp think Mrs Lowe would be able to do in the four months? Well, the initial uh, information we received is that the customer needs time to understand their situation, was not aware of their situation. Um, it, there were uh, three uh, assets, of uh, primary assets, involved uh, in the Lowe situation, the house at Hillsville, uh, which we heard about this morning, the investment unit in Caloundra, and the commercial premises at Hillsville. So um, there was opportunity to work out whether there was going to be sufficient income stream to service the debts or whether potentially assets would be sold in order to um, reduce the debts. Did you hear the evidence this morning about Mr Lowe's request on his mother's behalf for the loans to be consolidated? Yes, I did. And did you hear the evidence that Suncorp refused to permit the loans to be consolidated? Yes, I did. Do you stand by that decision? I haven't been able to find any um, record on file of that discussion. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I'm not suggesting it didn't happen, I just no, can't no, validate no. it. I just want to understand what your position is about assuming that did happen, whether that was the correct decision. Um, the situation here would be that we would have to have established the ability to repay and service, or service and repay the debts. So um, I don't know whether that would have been the right decision or the wrong decision at that time without... Th th there wasn't information at this point in time that would have suggested the debts could be serviced uh, on an ongoing basis. Suncorp has a financial hardship policy, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, and financial hardship is defined in that policy as when a customer is, is willing and has the intention to pay but is currently unable to meet their repayments or existing financial obligations. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so um, Mrs Lowe clearly was suffering from financial hardship? Yes. Uh, and your policy um, makes clear that the requirements within it are to be carefully followed, and I'll show you this reference if you need it, so that the bank's regulatory obligations are met and reputation risk is avoided. Do you recall that in your policy? I believe so, but I'm happy to accept it. Yep. And what is the reputation risk that Suncorp is seeking to avoid? Uh, the, people who've experienced financial distress, uh, it's not a position that people ever expected to be in, obviously, and it's a very challenging time for them. It's a quite a challenging time for our staff who, who support them through it. Uh, that can uh, cascade into a range of outcomes, and that includes uh, the um, uh, people who are dissatisfied with that process or experiencing hardship, uh, taking their concerns and issues into the public domain, into the media. Uh, when that happens, um, typically uh, the customer provides their view of the situation to the media, but in the absence of us being provided consent by the customer, which really happens, we are unable to put any other alternative views in and the, the, um, the media on that is typically quite negative. You said in that answer then, you mentioned uh, what happens when your staff are supporting a person through financial distress. Yes. Do you think your staff supported Mr Lowe and his mother through their financial distress? Uh, at this point in the hardship? Well, I, I, I'd like you to reflect on the entire experience firstly. Mm. Mm. Would you characterise this as an event um, in which Suncorp staff supported Mr Lowe and his mother through their financial distress? Yeah, based on my reading of the file, the file notes, talking to some of the people who still work with us today who were involved, I believe the intent of the team involved was very good. I can see and hear from today's uh, um, statement by Mr Lowe that the impact we may have had has not always been right and perhaps some of our communication could have been better. But when I look at the way in which it's been approached, I see good intention. 
what do you see that shows that good intention, Mr Carter? So uh, if I may move forward slightly yes. from here to the, the post-FOS determination period. Uh, FOS, as you heard uh, talk this morning, provides for 30 days, for example, to reach agreement post-determination, uh, all the FSP or the bank uh, lender is able to commence action to recover. We have not once commenced action to recover. Uh, we are 15 months down the track now and we continue to have an interest-free, repayment-free uh, residual debt that is the residual of business loan B. Um, we have uh, gone through a process of offer, uh, counter-offer, offer, counter-offer, counter um, and tried to find a middle ground to support the lows on the way through, but we have been unable to do so. Um, so that's what I mean by intent. I am happy to accept that some of the communication uh, has had a negative impact on Mr Lowe and his mother. So I think the essence of that answer is that you haven't taken action to recover the debt and that's, that's what's demonstrative of the good intent. Is that right? Well, that amongst other things, yes. Right. Uh, and you said that um, you thought you'd tried hard to reach a middle ground. Yes. The most you've offered, um, Mrs Lowe, is five years to repay a debt on a 30-year term loan. So the most we've offered is five years, interest-free and repayment-free, mm -hmm. prior to either achieving uh, clearance of the debt through uh, either a sale of an asset, repayment, uh, refinance of the debt, or placing the loan onto commercial terms uh, with a suitable arrangement, uh, which would require us to establish that Mrs Lowe could repay the debt in the time available. Why won't you let Mrs Lowe continue to make the existing repayments on the loan until the principal is discharged? That would amount to a 17-year interest-free yes. loan, correct? Yes. yes. Yes, so that would effectively result in uh, us going well outside what we believe both FOS and the Consumer, or La Consumer Action Law Centre would see as reasonable, which from the record that we have seen as part of this oh, matter... We can come to all okay. of that, but I want to focus on you, on Suncorp yep. for now, what, not what FOS thinks or anyone else yep. thinks. Why will you, Suncorp, not regard as reasonable the offer that's been made, the last offer that's been made, is to pay more than the existing repayments. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be interest-free interest because FOS has told you that you are not permitted to charge interest on this loan. Why will you not let Mrs Lowe make more than the existing repayments through until the end of the loan term? Uh, because it, whilst uh, it has to be interest-free until we... Um establish a reasonable period of time. Beyond that time, it does not have to be well, interest-free. I, I don't understand why you say that. Where in the FOS determination does it say that it's only interest-free until a reasonable payment plan is created? It's interest-free for the rest of the loan. That's the effect of the determination, is it not? I disagree. Uh, and could There's you a residual debt. Let's, uh, let's go to the determination yep. and can you explain that to me? This yep. is um, yep. an important issue. So the determination is Exhibit 26 in your statement. And 1584, so 0603 is where we see what I think is the relevant part of the determination, yes. the direction made by FOS about yes. how you were to deal with this matter, yes. given that this was an irresponsible loan. Yes. And perhaps we could have the next page brought up as well so we can see the entirety of that direction from FOS. Mm -hmm. Now, could you explain to me your understanding of what this permits you to do? Yes, it first asked the parties to try and come up with an agreed arrangement for a payment of the revised debt. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this may be to pay the debts by sale of the property refinance or a reasonable payment arrangement accompanied by some information to justify yes. it. Um, that the parties should work together. If they're unable to work to reach an agreement for a payment of the debts within 30 days, or if no proposal is provided, the bank may rec commence recovery action. Mm -hmm once the dispute is closed. And our view is that a reasonable period to continue the loan on an interest-free basis uh, is 12 months, uh, six to 12 months, and that is con by convention. I, Can we pause there? Because yes. I do want to explore this. Yes. So 
There's nothing in this direction that tells us that, is there? FOS doesn't give any guidance about what a reasonable arrangement to repay the debts is. It just tells you that you're to go off and reach a reasonable arrangement to repay the debts. Uh, I agree, that's what is that, that says. Right? Yes. So you say Suncorp's view is that the outer boundaries of a reasonable arrangement to repay the debts are that the entirety of the debt has to be paid off within six to 12 months. Is that right? No, the uh, entirety of the interest-free, yes. as an interest-free debt, well, that's the only debt left, isn't it? Well, is yes, it? but it's not the only potential repayment arrangement. So uh, the debt is either uh, cleared, refinanced, which would be yes. clearing it, or alternatively, a, a, a long-term repayment arrangement is entered into. Mm -hmm. So the entirety of the debt is the 221.945. That's, yes. that's the debt that's been reduced to take off the interest that you've yes. already charged. You accept that you're not permitted to charge any more interest? Uh, Whilst that loan is on foot as it is, yes. Yes, I'm not sure what that qualifier well, means. At this stage, this is a this is a debt. It's not a it's not a loan, per se. It's a residual debt. And I know that sounds pedantic, but um, we have not got uh, a loan contract to take forward at this point. We have to try and work out a way to take it forward. I don't understand that, um, Mr. Carter. You do have a loan contract that's on foot with Mrs. Lowe. Uh, well, I, that's not my sense of it. I don't understand where that sense comes from. Where in these paragraphs do we see anything from FOS that renders void or otherwise eliminates the contractual arrangement that you have with Mrs Lowe? Uh, I, I don't see that, no. It's not there, is it? No. Because FOS doesn't do anything to render um, void or unenforceable that contractual arrangement. Instead, in these subsequent paragraphs, we see that they're preserving your <coughs> rights to take action under that contract. Yes, correct. So you want the contract enforced for that purpose, so you can take enforcement action. But on the other hand, you're telling me that the contract somehow doesn't exist now. So I'm, uh, I guess, uh, referring to uh, the, the way this gets resolved is we uh, continue for a period of time. We reach an acceptable arrangement, ideally. Uh, if we can't reach an acceptable right arrangement, we are able to take, go revert back to a, an alternative option. But that in reaching an acceptable arrangement, there is an acceptance in practice that there will not be a continuation of interest-free lending forever. Why is that accepted in practice? We see nothing that reflects that in this FOS determination, do we? I accept that it's not in the determination, yes. What we see here is a statement from FOS that the applicant remains liable for the revised debt under business loan B. Correct. Which tells us that the loan contract continues. So that is not the practice of what happens in these situations. How has that practice developed, Mr Carter? My understanding is it's, it's practice that's developed across the industry. And it's uh, an outcome that is um, consistent with FOS's expectations and, and indeed with other, other parties who often act on behalf of consumers. I want to put to you squarely, Mr Carter, that if that is a practice that's developed across the industry, it's an unacceptable practice because it does not accord applicants their entitlements to continue with the loan contract that remains in force. Uh, I'm unable to uh, opine on that, it's not... So can I come back to my original question now that we've um, uh, gone to these paragraphs, noting that your obligation under these paragraphs is to work with the applicant to attempt to agree on a reasonable arrangement to repay the debts. Yep. My original question was, why is it not a reasonable proposal to offer to continue to make the existing payments for the life of the loan. Mm -hmm. Can I just yep. make sure I understand your answer to that yes. question? So that, over a 17 year term, that would essentially, depending on your view of the discount rate, represent either a, somewhere between a 50 to 100% write off of the principal and why over the time. Why should Suncorp not have to accept that when it was irresponsible lending by Suncorp that has caused this situation? 
Uh, firstly, I think uh, the borrowers had the benefit of the funds as per FOS's determination. Secondly, we yes, we made mistakes in assessing the lending, but we were uh, misled and deceived as to the purpose by the borrower and we were misled and deceived as to the financial results of the business and the financial data provided to us by people outside of Suncorp. So whilst we made a mistake and we did not pick up that deceit, um, uh, this is uh, something that um, we have found ourselves in as a result of the misdeeds of others. Well, <laughs> that's not the way you've characterised this in your statement, uh, Mr Carter. Uh, in your statement, you accept that the fault for this lies with Suncorp in the errors that they made and the failures in their conduct in 2014 in approving this loan. Yes, as to the purpose, I agree, and that's why I agree with the findings uh, of irresponsibility, yes. I, I want to put to you that the approach that you take to this direction from FOS um, is an approach that penalises the applicant and places an applicant who has succeeded in FOS in potentially a worse position than they were in before they commenced the application because now they can't continue to pay principal and interest for the remainder of the term. Now they face you saying to them that the entirety of the loan has to be paid off within six to 12 months. Yeah, arrangements need to be reached around the residual balance or the residual debt. Uh, there are several options to do that. We can only extend the interest-free period for a finite period of time before we wish to have a more permanent arrangement. Um, I want to put to you that applicants may not proceed with applications to FOS if they realise that this is what success looks like. Success is you saying you now have six to 12 months to pay the entirety of the loan off, even though it was lent irresponsibly to you. I accept that. All right. Now, I want to take you to um, some of the details of the way that Suncorp engaged with the Lowe's after this FOS determination. Um, you heard Mr Lowe's evidence that in February 2017, in between the recommendation and the determination, he contacted Suncorp to explain that his mother had received an offer to purchase the family home. Yes. And he, you heard his evidence about the conversation he had with uh, a particular, I was going to yes, say banker, perhaps yes, advisor, no, yes. uh, in group customer relations, who um, told him on a number of occasions in that call that um, if she wasn't happy with the price of the home, Suncorp had the power to cancel the sale and evict Mrs Lowe um, so that Suncorp could sell the property. Uh I heard the evidence this morning. I wasn't in the conversation. Our file notes have slightly different record as a record of the, uh, the person uh, relaying very similar information to Mr Lowe that had been relayed to him two days before by someone from FOS. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't, as to the specifics of the conversation, only the people who are in the conversation can know that. You heard Mr Lowe's evidence about the impact that that telephone yes, I did. call had on him and on his mother? Yes, I did. And you heard his evidence that he made a complaint about the way that person conducted that telephone call to her supervisor? Yes, I did. Um, you're aware that that happened? Uh, again, I am aware of uh, Mr Lowe's um, evidence. Uh, I cannot find a record in preparing for this in our system or in our notes of that complaint or a conversation occurring with the second person. Assuming the conversation proceeded as Mr Lowe's evidence indicates it did, mm -hmm. um, what do you say as to whether that was an acceptable way for your representative to conduct that conversation? If that is what had happened, it wouldn't have been acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't found a record of the complaint, did you say? Correct. Have you found any record of that customer relations banker being disciplined in any way for the way she handled that call? Not that call on the 8th of February, no. Um, have you seen documents that suggest she was disciplined at a later time? As Mr Lowe mentioned this morning, uh, around about the 5th or 8th of May, maybe the 5th of May, uh, there was another call between that person and, and Mr Lowe. Uh, Mr Lowe did then speak to uh, another person. That is recorded, as in there's a note about that conversation. Uh, and in that conversation, a complaint is made mm -hmm. uh, about her conduct. Um, and uh, I see a record of people um, uh, noting that. Uh, I see that, or when talking to the people involved, 
Um, I understand they looked at the um, advisors' uh, other matters in recent times, had no other evidence or, or suggestion of complaints made against her, but made the decision to defuse the situation to remove her from day-to-day -day engagement uh, with Mr Lowe. So she was taken off the file? She was taken away from day-to-day -day communication with Mr Lowe. The reason she was not removed fully was that she had the knowledge of the matter as it had been proceeding. Did Suncorp not think it would be best to ask her to impart that knowledge to someone else who could take over that role on the file? Uh, no, I think uh, we have a small number of people who can manage these matters um, and it is important to have continuity where possible. And so, Matt, yeah, yes. we, we did not necessarily accept uh, by removing her from the situation, we did not accept necessarily that she had done what had been alleged. All we wanted to do was reduce the tension in the relationship. Why didn't you accept what had been alleged? Did you disbelieve Mr Lowe? We just didn't have proof of it. So, in fairness, we have an obligation to support our staff as well as listen to our customers. And do you think you have an obligation to, when you say listen to your customers and accept what they tell you? Well, um, we diffused it by removing her from the situation. But so we didn't, dis we didn't deny what had been said. We just saw the best way of dealing with this was to diffuse it. Did you accept what had been said? We accepted that Mr Lowe was unhappy dealing with the person. Mm -hmm. it, it seems that you're at pains to not concede that there was any um, failing in that person's conduct on that phone call. Is that right? Well, I, I can't... I, I, all I have as evidence is her file note of the conversation, the file notes of others and Mr Lowe this morning. So we have a difference of views. So I'm not saying it didn't happen, I just can't say that it did. All right, I, I just want to take you to some emails from around that time. Yes. That was in early May 2017. Yes. Could I ask that you look at um, SUN 0603-0005-1513? Uh, so this is an email from the same person to others within Suncorp on the 5th of May 2017. Uh, and we see here that the customer relations banker is sending Mr Lowe's proposal for the repayment of the loans. Um, uh, firstly, I'm sorry, if we go to the second page over, to Mr Ian Goldspring. I'll wait till that comes up. We need that page and the page that follows so you can see the entirety of that email. Do you see that there, Mr yes. Carter? Yes. Um, now, I appreciate that you have this in redacted form, but you've seen this document before, I assume? Yes. And you know it is an email from the Customer uh, Relations Banker? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, and we see there, um, highlighted in yellow at the bottom, that. Um, she comments on the proposal. The proposal means loan accounts maintenance will need to manually do credit adjustments to reverse 0.01% interest charged by Hogan forever. Can you explain what that means, Mr yes. Carter? The, the Hogan is a system, a computer system. The system cannot accept a 0% interest rate. I just want to be clear about that. So your Suncorp systems do not permit a 0% an interest-free loan to be recorded in your systems? That, that's my understanding, yes. Why not? I, I can't tell you. I, I have inquired to ch confirm that as part of preparing for today. Um, I'm told that 0.01 is the lowest it can go. It's the best you can do in your system, 0.01? That is my belief, for a, for a loan. So this customer um, relations banker is making sure that Mr Goldspring uh, knows that the system can't, in fact, deal with a 0% interest loan without making manual credit adjustments? No, I believe so. Mm -hmm. I see. And we see that two days later, and now we need the page that's on the left-hand side to be on the right and the previous page <coughs> to be placed next to it so we can see the entirety of the next email in the chain. So we need 1513 and 1514 on the screen. Uh, 
Uh, this is another email from the same person to a number of others within Suncorp, including Mr Goldspring, Mr Muldrick and Wendy Corcott. Yes. And we see here that the customs relations banker is referring to dissatisfaction that Mr Lowe has expressed with her. Yes. And uh, he's going to be told that now Darren or someone in retail recoveries will deal with him. Yes, I believe that's the thrust of that. Now, then uh, the customer relations banker goes on to give an account of various conversations that she's had, including with Mr Lowe. And she says that she's explained to Mr Lowe that generally the bank will decide which loans to pay off first. Correct. Is that right? Yes. And is that fair? Yeah, I think that's, that's the way um, our contracts enable us to deal with the proceeds of sale. Even when one of those loans is the subject of maladministration? I believe so. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a desire within Suncorp to use the proceeds of sale first to pay off the loan that was business loan B, the loan that was subject of maladministration and second to the loans that had been responsibly entered into. Is that right? Yes, and I believe that's consistent with uh, broader practice in the industry. Do you think that's an appropriate practice? Um, I've not turned my mind to the question, uh, and in the end in this one we didn't do that. We paid off the interest-bearing loans. But that took some doing to get to that position, didn't it? This was the bank's original position, that the bank could choose which loan to pay off first, and it wanted the loan that was the subject of maladministration paid off first. That was the starting point in this conversation, yes. And so why should a customer have to repay a loan that was irresponsibly advanced to them before other sound loans? Well, I, I think in practice it would go back to the contention that the benefit was received for, for the loans. Um, and those loans are at that point interest free, so practice would normally be for that to be paid first. But we did not do that. We went above the, the practice. I understand your evidence about that, but yes. I, I'm interested in this as the practice that Suncorp adopts. Um, and it's beneficial to the bank, isn't it? Because that means the bank can terminate the loan that it's not receiving any interest on uh, and keep the loans going that are profitable loans, the loans that it is receiving interest on. That's correct. Yes. But it's, it penalises the customer who's taken the time to get a finding that this is an irresponsible loan, thinking that that's ultimately going to be advantageous to them. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with penalises, but it resolves, a, it resolves a loan that the parties need to resolve within a period of time, in this case. In the way the bank wants that resolved? That it, it would enable, well, it helps both parties to get it resolved, doesn't it? Because if it's not resolved within a period, uh, the bank is able to take enforcement action. Well, let's come back to that. Assuming the customer is not in <coughs> default, what enforcement action is the bank entitled to take on the irresponsible loan? So my understanding of the way this works is that uh, the residual or revised debt, which is the residual of business loan B, uh, that arrangements should be need to be agreed, and if they can't be agreed, the loan contract, I presume, is considered to have become at an end. And that is why the determination says that if parties are unable to reach agreement for that loan, uh, then the, the FSP or the bank concerned is able to uh, commence other actions. And we've been over this already, and I, I don't want to go back to it in any detail, but you accept, don't you, that there is nothing in the FOS determination that suggests that the loan will be at an end if a reasonable repayment arrangement cannot be reached? Uh, so, uh, I'm, I, no, I'm not a lawyer, but I read the paragraph that says if the parties are unable to reach an agreement within 30 days, or if no proposal is provided, the FSP may be entitled to commence recovery action with respect to the debts. That's as a un under the loan contract, isn't it? Uh, under the operative loan contract. Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't read it that way. Okay, thank you. I tender this email exchange, Commissioner. Uh, Suncorp emails of May 2017 to Jackson and others. SUN 0603 005 1513, Exhibit 3.79. Uh, 
All right. Can I take you, um, uh, Mr Carter, to the letter that was sent to Mrs Lowe dated the 12th of June 2017 containing a formal offer yes. in relation to the repayment of these loans? That's Exhibit 31 to your statement, SUN 0608 0001 Uh, so this is a letter from um, Mr Muldrick, whose name we saw on an earlier email, to Mrs Lowe, containing a formal offer in relation to the repayment of the facilities. Yes. Uh, and it's a letter expressed in strict legal terms. Do you accept that? Yes. Yep. And it has a strict time frame for acceptance, which yes. expires seven days after the date of the letter. Yes. And the offer in this letter was that the proceeds of sale would be used to pay the first four loans. Yes. So there's been a shift in the bank's position, as you indicated, about which loans to pay off first by yes. the date of this letter. Um, the excess proceeds of sale will be returned to Mrs Lowe and she'll then have six months until the 30th of November to repay business loan B. Correct. Yes. Uh, now... I just want to put to you in relation to each of these offers um, that this was not attempting to agree on a reasonable arrangement with Mrs Lowe to repay the debts. This was the bank not wanting an interest-free loan on its books for any extended period. Uh, I, I feel I've said before, I, I believe that this is reasonable in context of acceptable practice. I am happy to agree that you believe it's not acceptable practice, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to base it off the industry's approach generally. Mm -hmm. And what if you take yourself outside the industry's approach, Mr Carter, and forget about that for now, and try and think about this in the context of this case? Yes. Was this a reasonable offer in relation to the repayment of these loans to Mrs Lowe? This is a particularly uh, unusual case and uh, I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, it is not, um, in our experience, we don't see a lot of occasions where there is a, a false determination where there is a residual or revised debt uh, when there are other, when there are a situation like this where there are multiple debts and there is something left behind. Um, the complexity with this one with respect to uh, the conduct around the origination of the loan, the mislead, leading piece on the uh, purpose and also what transpires later in terms of the financial data that uh, we've been alleged to have been provided with as being incorrect. The situation uh, of Mrs Lowe at the end, the circumstances involving Mr Lowe's death, there's a lot of things happening in this loan. So I think in these situations th there needs to be a range of potential outcomes that are reasonable. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I don't think there's a single answer, is my short version. Well, uh, having considered all of the matters mm. that you've clearly just turned your mind to, I, I'm interested in whether you regard this in all of those circumstances to mm. have been a reasonable approach to Mrs Lowe and her situation. Yeah, I, I do. I do believe it. Um, to repay the $220,000 in full in six months. So I understand, as you said, it's a very legal-looking letter. Yes. And I, when I read it through the eyes of someone who's not familiar with banking, I understand why that impact is there. And um, our, in, in practice, what happens with this would be that um, arrangements would occur either to clear the loan, to refinance the loan, or to put it on to a commercial uh, terms basis and a longer-term repayment. So practice would normally not be to have a, a long-term interest-free loan. I'm just not sure I got an answer to my question in all of that, Mr Carter. Well, but at, the, at the end of November, that loan will have had approximately nine months as interest-free and repayment-free. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, our understanding of uh, what is acceptable practice uh, is six to 12 months would be acceptable practice. Yes, all right. Um, can we turn then to the um, uh, letter that was um, received by the Lowe's uh, 
with your name yes. on the bottom of it. Um, that is Exhibit 20 to um, Mr uh, Lowe's statement. It's RCD 0014 0006 0001. <coughs> You've seen this letter before, Mr Carter? Yes. What explanation can you give to the Commission about why uh, Mrs Lowe received this letter? Yes. Um, upon the um, uh, sale of the Hillsville property, the surplus funds were applied to business loan B. That um, reduced the balance. The system automatically triggers a letter when either interest rates or uh, well, sorry, when repayments necessary to clear the loan over the remaining term uh, can change. And so with the reduction in the principal, with the 0 0.01, but the 0% interest rate applying to the loan, the system automatically has calculated that in the loan term remaining, because at this stage we have not reached agreement on the revised debt, so the loan is in situ, um, then that level of repayment would clear the loan over the remaining term. And so, now, I heard Mr Lowe's uh, evidence, and in fact, in reading his uh, statement yesterday when it came through, uh, we did not see, uh, when we th looked at this matter when it rose at the time, we just did not see that, how, we, we did not realise the impact that had, uh, or that uh, did not see it, that someone would see this as being an offer to extend. We just, it did not enter the mind of people at the time. I think as Mr Lowe expressed himself this morning, his initial reaction from us through the people he dealt with was we didn't know what the letter was. Um, and so we were, um, we, I understand the impact, I can see why it had that impact, but it was not something that we um, were awake to at the time. And what do you think of the evidence that Mrs. Mr Lowe gave about the way the bank handled um, the conversations with him in the light of his receipt of this letter. You heard that evidence yeah, earlier today? Yeah, I did. Today? Uh, and, and if I uh, paraphrase, uh, I think yeah. um, he was um, initially happy uh, and then disappointed and surprised that he was getting uh, a call from someone to say that we didn't know what the letter was. Mm. Um, and if I may say, equally at Suncorp, we were surprised we'd received um, notification from Mr Lowe that we'd made an offer on this basis and he'd received a letter from, essentially from me. This is a letter that issues uh, from the system. I authorised my signature to be applied to the letter, uh, but it was not a letter that any one person had seen go out. But why was it not a letter you could find on your systems then? <coughs> so that when Mr Lowe said to Ms Corcott, I've got this letter that mm. I think is responsive to my offer, why couldn't someone find this letter on the system? Because the evidence of Mr Lowe was that Ms Corcott express some disbelief yes. about his receipt of this letter. Yeah. Well, initially we didn't think it was a repayment change letter. It was described as a letter of offer. So we went looking where the letters of offer are stored. The team also approached uh, me or my office and asked whether we had issued a letter specifically. Um, no one th thought of it as being this particular letter. We asked Mr Lowe to send the letter through. Uh, these letters are sent out through a, a process. Um, we store a record. Uh, that this this um, um, this letter has a particular title, if you like. We store a record that on a, on a particular loan account that this letter has issued, uh, so we know that it has gone out. Um, but we don't store copies of the letter per se because it's a, for one of a better description, it's a form letter. Well, I want to put to you that around by this time, Mr. Lowe is not getting much of the benefit of the doubt from Suncorp in his dealings with them. Do you accept that? Yes. And why did that happen? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, I, again, I, I see when I look through the file and I talk to the people who are still here. Not everyone is here uh, still, but um, I see. I see good intent, but I see uh, uh, the impact of the communication being negative on Mr. Lowe. Well, I want to come back to that good intent, um, Mr. Carter. I want to show you. SUN 0603 Now, this is 
a record of an online conversation between Mr Ian Goldspring, who we've seen before, uh, and the customer relations banker on the 13th of July, 2017. Yes. Right? yes. And what position did Mr Goldspring hold at this time? Uh, he's a, a, um, a um, uh, I'm trying to use the title. He works in our product team. Mm -hmm. um, and the customer relations banker tells Mr Goldspring in this online conversation that she's on a call to FOS about Jennifer Lowe. Yes. Um, now, Mr Goldspring says to the customer relations banker, yes, I need to discuss with you, please. WTF is this son up to? Yes. What do you say about this communication between two of your representatives about Mr Lowe and the situation he was facing at this time? Yeah, the language is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I've spoken to Mr Goldspring about it and said that. It's not just the language that was inappropriate, is it, Mr Carter? The sentiment that sits behind this language was also inappropriate. Yes, uh, that's correct. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm not prepared to agree fully on that. Um, this this is, relates to something to do with the media. Um, we have, at this stage, um, been going through a period of trying to get to offer acceptance, offer acceptance. We seem to be getting close, but we can't quite get there. So we're unsure of what is going on. The language used to describe it, which is quite colloquial, obviously, is inappropriate. So do you say that, but for the language, this was appropriate? We're, I'm trying to understand what Mr Lowe was doing, I think was important and appropriate. I think the language is inappropriate. All right. Was any disciplinary action taken in relation to Mr Goldspring for this communication? I hadn't seen it at the time. As in preparing for this, I have spoken to Mr Goldspring and said I think it's inappropriate. All right. I tender that document, Commissioner. Give us 3.80 online conversation. Uh, Goldspring 13, uh, July 17, SUN 0603 0060158. Uh, could I ask that you be shown SUN 0603 0004032? Uh, now, th this is a series of emails between Wendy Corcott uh, and someone by the name of, uh, well, some, yes. some are with the um, yes. customer relations banker, uh, but uh, also with uh, Mr Dennis O'Coyline. Is that right? I can't pronounce his surname either, sorry, but yes, I know who you mean. Yes, thank you. Uh, and we see there that... Um, there is a discussion about the surplus funds from the sale of the family home and the customer relations banker explains that those surplus sale proceeds are sitting in the maladministration loan. They've gone to business loan B. Yes. To which Wendy Corcott says, why didn't we give it to them? Have we told them it is there and available for them to draw on? Yes. And no one had, had they? No because unlike Wendy Corcott, they didn't think that Mr Lowe and his mother were entitled to the surplus funds, did they? So this is in between, uh, again, a period of offer uh, and acceptance. The last offer we had provided was that the Lowe's had asked for the surplus funds. We had asked for agreement to the term uh, as a condition of, of the return of the funds. Mm -hmm. We had not achieved uh, an acceptance, but we did not want to delay the settlement of the Hillsville property. We wanted to be able to pay out the interest-bearing loans, and we wanted to make sure, excuse me, <clears throat> there were no uh, costs incurred by Mrs Lowe by missing settlement. So we had deposited the funds, uh, as you can see there in one of the boxes. We put it in as an advance payment, so the intention was there to make it available, but we were waiting to get acceptance. I see. I tend to that email chain, Commissioner. The emails, call cut and others, 28 July 17, SUN 0603 0004 Exhibit 3.81. Uh, could I ask that you be shown SUN 0603 0006 This is another email chain from around the same time. This one's from early August 2017. 
I think it will come up shortly, Mr Carter. Mm -hmm. Now, if we could turn to 0540. Uh, I see that perhaps the name of the person who is oh. the subject of a non-publication direction had not been redacted from this document, Commissioner. Perhaps we can try and address that. Um, I'm happy if you just want to read it. I think I yes. am familiar with this email. Yes. Yes, you saw enough. Do you think? I think I'm, I think I. Uh, if I need help, I'll ask. Please. Can I? Can I? Yes, read? please. And um, if that doesn't work, and you yep. need the assistance of the document, we'll we'll deal with that then. It was an email chain. Uh, that followed Mr Lowe's communication with Ms Corcott about the receipt of the letter, letter from yes. you. Yes. Uh, and uh, the customer relations banker uh, tells a group of people within Suncorp that Mr Lowe says he has received that letter. Yes. And she seeks clarification about whether anyone issued the letter. Yes. And if so, why, given that it wasn't in line with the current approved offer? Yes. Uh, so internally at that time, no one seems to know where this letter has come from, as Correct. you've explained. Yes. Uh, and then there's an email in that chain from Ian Goldspring to you um, the following day. And he says, do you remember this matter? To which you say, no, I don't know what happened here. Keen to find out. Yes. Do you recall that? Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, and at the bottom of um, one of the pages, we see that someone called Amanda Adams, who I assume might be connected with your office. That's Is right. Is that right? Yes. Uh, asks whether Mr Lowe has provided a copy of that letter. Yes. And Mr Goldspring, here we go. Mr Goldspring says... That's oh, still there, I'm told. Let's just try and do this without yeah. the document, please. I I'm happy for you to do it without yes. the document. It's fine. Thank you. Um, uh, Ian Goldspring says, this is sounding a little strange to me. Do you recall reading that? I know there's an email from Ian at the top. Is yes. that the one you mean? Yes. yes. So there's the exchange with you. You say, I don't know what happened here. Keen to find out. Yes. Amanda Adams then comes yes. in and asks whether yep. he's provided a letter. Ian Goldspring, who's been a recipient of all of those emails, then comes in and says, this is sounding a little strange to me. Yes. And really what I want to put to you is that the Suncorp employees were very sceptical about what Mr Lowe told Ms Corcott, very disbelieving of his assertion about receiving this letter. Yes, I, because we couldn't establish what it was, I think. I might have my dates wrong, but I think we'd asked Mr Lowe for a copy of the letter. I don't think he uh, wanted to send it in or had no, sent it in, I'm not sure. That's exactly right, because uh, Wendy Corcott goes on to say he has not provided a copy but was very certain of the details. Yes, and so we are still, as I said earlier, we are looking for a letter of offer, mm -hmm. which, as you highlighted before, are typically very legally uh, oriented letters, so they're easy to spot. Um, and we had no idea at that time that it was a letter regarding a repayment change, so there was no that. record of it. I understand that. Mm. Uh, what, what I want to ask you about is particularly the attitude of Mr Goldspring, as revealed in um, this email chain, first by saying this is sounding a little strange to me, mm -hmm. and after Ms Corcott says he's not provided a copy but was very certain of the details, Mr Goldspring says this sounds like he is up to something. Yes. He wasn't up to something, was he, Mr Carter? He had well, received the letter. As it turns out, he'd received the letter, yes. Yes. Um, it was an error on the part of the bank to communicate with him in that way at that point <coughs> of the discussions about the repayment of the loans, wasn't that. it? I accept that, yes. Um, and Suncorp's suspicions of Mr Lowe were misplaced, weren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the effect of that letter you've heard Mr Lowe's evidence about it, it misled them, didn't it? Yeah, I understand that, yes. It got their hopes up that Suncorp had agreed to a repayment plan that would allow them to repay on, on an acceptable yes. ongoing rate? Is that yes. That's right? Yes. Okay. Now, I, I do want to tender that email chain. Um, email chain, Goldspring, Callcut and others, August 17, SUN 0603 0060539, Exhibit 3.82. Can I take you, Mr Carter, to an exhibit to your statement, Exhibit 40, um, which is a letter from Ms Corcott to Mrs Lowe on the 22nd of August 
2017. Yes, we have that letter of the 22nd of August. And what I want to direct your attention to in this letter is the third paragraph down. Um, so Mrs Lowe is being told by Ms Corcott in this letter, as the FOS determination concluded that Suncorp should not have approved the credit to Mr and Mrs Lowe, this meant the loan contract was void ab initio. Do you understand what that means, Mr Carter? Uh, I believe it means that neither party should benefit from the loan. Neither party should benefit from the loan? Yes, that's my understanding, but okay. I apologise if it's not quite there. Uh, and do you know what Ms Colcott's understanding of that term was when she wrote this letter? Uh, I haven't spoken to her about it, but I would assume she knows, given this is the area she works in. And was there anything in the FOS determination that indicated that the effect of the determination was to render the loan contract void ab initio? Um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's my honest answer. And we mm. see in the final paragraph before option one here, Notwithstanding the above, in the spirit of resolving the matter, Suncorp is willing to extend the following final options to Mrs Lowe. So this was the two option letter, the five year yes. or the two year repayment. Please take note, Suncorp is not prepared to entertain any amendments to these options. That's what it says, yes. Was, was that a reasonable approach, Mr Carter? I think at this point we're um, five, or so months since the determination, six months since the determination issued, where the parties were asked within 30 days to try and come up with an arrangement that they could agree on. Uh, we've been back and forth a few times. Um, and I think the, again, and I accept that there's a different view here, but having regard to practice, having regard to um, the views of FOS and others, at five years, interest uh, free and repayment free, this is well above what would be considered reasonable, accepting your previous uh, points. Yes, I understand. All right. And in this same month, in August 2017, FOS set up a conciliation conference in relation to the yes. second FOS complaint. Uh, and Suncorp spoke to FOS about its position in the lead up to that conciliation conference? Yes, I believe so. Uh, and the customer relations banker participated in the conciliation conference? Uh, I established that just this week, yes. Yes, and why did that happen? Uh, when I inquired, it's because that person had the knowledge of the matter. Uh, I wasn't aware of that until this week. Um, you gave evidence before, and I'm struggling to find <coughs> my note of it, uh, about um, exactly what had happened with the customer relations officer. Uh, she hadn't been taken off the file entirely. Correct. You said something to the effect of she'd been taken off the interaction with Mr Lowe? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, taken away from day-to-day -day interaction with Mr Lowe yes. was your evidence. Um, so why did Suncorp permit her to participate in the conciliation conference with Mr Lowe? I, I don't know. Was that the right decision? I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so your position is that she should not have participated in the conciliation conference? Yes. And you heard the evidence that was given by Mr Lowe about um, part of her um, contribution in the conciliation conference. Uh, she told Mr Lowe in that conciliation conference that if he proceeded to determination with his FOS complaint, Suncorp would take this offer uh, from the 22 August letter off the table. Yes, I heard that. And that was what happened? Uh, I, I, I believe so. Yes. I wasn't there. So. And was that the right thing to do? Uh, I, I don't know the context other than what was said. I'm not disagreeing it was said. I assume the context was the determination would be the determination and, uh, and therefore it might be different. It may not permit this offer. I don't know because I wasn't there. But it was an attempt to never get to the determination stage, wasn't it? Well, because well, this is a conciliation conference, the purpose of which is to try and avoid getting to the determination stage. Yep. 
Uh, you heard the evidence of Mr Lowe about how he reacted to that, that he found that yes. to be a threat? I understand, yes. Um, what do you say to that? Again, I think it's the impact of, on our communication style is not good. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a fair way to approach the conciliation conference? Um, again, I, don't, I, I just don't know the context of, of, of it I, or the assumption behind it being put to Mr Lowe that way. I can assume it was because the, the offer would come to an end with the determination, but I don't know. There was no contractual basis, was there, Mr Carter, for Suncorp to insist on early repayment of the loan? I, I, I must apologise. I, I don't know uh, what happens once we get to that uh, place with FOS where they uh, issue the determination with the language that is used. Mm -hmm. are, are you familiar with the standard loan contracts that Suncorp uses? Yes. Are there any terms in there that would permit Suncorp I'm not familiar with that level of detail in the contract, sorry. Okay, you can't point to anything that permits that? Uh, no, and I, I can't tell you if there is something or there isn't. All right. Um, now, can I take you to, I think, one final document, uh, Mr Carter, uh, which is Suncorp's submission to the Commissioner on the 29th of January this year. Have you seen that document yes, I have. before? That's RCD 0000040002. So you said you, you're familiar with this document? I think, as you know, I signed it. Yes, I do know that. Yes. Thank you, Mr Carter. Um, 0013 is the first page I'd just ask you to have a look at. So um, you know that this was prepared in response to a letter from the Commissioner asking Suncorp um, to articulate any events of misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations over the last 10 years? Yes. All right. And in response to that request, one of the things that Suncorp pointed out at 0013, um, at 1.14, down the bottom of the page, was that following a FOS investigation completed in mid-2012 and an internal review of hardship files by SML, now SML is the banking, yes. banking part of the business, yes. It was determined that Suncorp had misapplied its hardship requests policy in a number of instances. Yes. We see that. And later in that paragraph, you explain, you provide a bit of detail about those failings. Yes. Um, now, uh, we see that those failings related to things such as um, parties to joint loans. Yes. Uh, customers having their requests for hardship assistance declined due to the non-return of statement of position forms? Yes. And Suncorp refusing to consider requests for hardship assistance in relation to line of credit types of facilities? Yes. So these were all things that Suncorp discovered about its approach to hardship requests as a result of firstly a FOS investigation into this and your own internal review of your hardship files? Yes, that's correct. Have changes been made to deal with these problems since they were discovered? Yes, there has. And what are the nature of those changes, Mr Carter? The most significant changes occurred um, through the, progressively, but the most significant changes have actually occurred in the last 12 months. Uh, so this area of financial distress, as I said earlier, is a very challenging area. People don't expect to find themselves in this situation. Uh, and our staff who deal with it find it challenging as well, uh, and it takes a toll on both parties. Um, we found uh, that we we, did that, we responded to this issue, but over time uh, we thought there was a better way of doing it. And um, last year we looked at best practice, identified best practice, worked with some external uh, consumer advocate groups, identified Kildona and Uniting Care as the leaders in this field, brought them in, and they engaged with us and recommended a number of changes, which we started implementing towards the end of 2017, have been progressively implementing since. Um, and the result of that in the last, however long, six, eight months, has been a significant reduction in complaints regarded, relating to uh, hardship and a reduction in cases at FOS relating to hardship. Mm -hmm. 
this was a problem for you before these changes were made, wasn't it? In 2012? Yes, and, and post-2012 you continued to receive complaints about the handling of hardship requests. Yes, we have. Yes, and so we, um, we've tried different things to, to get a, a better outcome for customers. And, and uh, I, as I said last year, we identified we needed to do something uh, again uh, to try and make a material impact. Unfortunately, hardship requests are typically twofold. There are people who are in genuine hardship and we need to get those absolutely right. Uh, from time to time, people request hardship who are not in genuine hardship. And sometimes those people, when they are declined, will complain. So we accept, and I accept, there might be uh, complaints for that, but there should not be any complaints for people who have genuine difficulties. And that is our focus in trying to make significant change, as we have done over the last, um, I don't know, eight, nine months now. So what it, can you just summarise the key change or changes that you've made? Yeah, there are, there's a number of things. So. Um, coaching for our staff around how they engage with uh, customers experiencing financial distress, recognising that, that this is probably the first time a customer has experienced this situation. Um, focusing less on the policy requirements for provision of information, um, taking information over the phone rather than holding it in writing. I know that doesn't sound like much, but that has a big impact on the way the customer experiences the process. So those are the changes that you've made? They are examples of them. I, I don't have an exhaustive list with me, having not prepared for that. Okay. Um, now, can I just direct you to one other issue in this uh, document that was provided to the Commissioner? Yes. Which relates to a different part of the business. If we turn to 2.8 uh, in the document, which is at page uh, 0018, We see under the heading dispute resolution issue that in February last year, FOS notified Suncorp's life insurance business, have I got that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, that there was a systemic issue in relation to delayed resolution of internal dispute resolution processes, responses to FOS and compliance with FOS determinations. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so that's an issue that's arisen in another part of the business, but a significant issue, is it not, particularly as it covers compliance with FOS determinations? I don't... I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day management of that part of the business, but I, if it's in this, it's obviously one we thought met the criteria for uh, relevant conduct for the purpose of the Commission, so it, it must be material. And do you think there are issues in your world, in the banking part of Suncorp, um, with your responses to FOS determinations and your compliance with FOS determinations? Uh, no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that the way um, Suncorp engaged with the Lowe's following the Suncorp, I'm sorry, following the FOS determination was reasonable and fair? Yeah, again, I so I think from my review of the information, the intention behind what we did was fair. I absolutely accept the impact we have had has been less than um, desirable. So we need to work out how to do that differently going forward. There were times in your negotiations with the Lowe's where there was a threat to commence charging interest at some point in the process. Have you seen that in the documents? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't immediately recall it. Okay, well, uh, for the purposes I'll accept, of this... I accept what you're saying. Um, now, FOS had told you that you were not permitted to charge interest because this loan had been irresponsibly lent. Do you think it was appropriate that in that negotiation process, part of the negotiations involved a threat to introduce interest? I, under I understand your point of view on this. I hope I've been able to articulate my understanding of the way we do things as, as an industry and as FOS and CALC and others would see as acceptable, which is at some point the interest-free period comes to an end yes. and there is a new arrangement created. Is this connected with your idea that the loan ceases to exist and you can enter into new terms Correct. as you see fit? Not as we see fit, by agreement. By agreement. So why would an applicant ever agree um, to pay interest again when FOS had told them that 
you didn't have an entitlement to charge interest? Uh, again, I'm... You, you, you know where we're... It comes back to the Go same on. point? It will come back to the same point, yes. Yes, I see. All right. All right. Um, uh, you're aware, aren't you, that by being a subscriber to the Code of Banking Practice, Suncorp promises to its customers that it will act fairly and reasonably towards them in a consistent and ethical manner? Yes. And in doing so, they'll consider their conduct, um, the conduct of the customer and the contract between them? Yes. Do you think that Suncorp's conduct through the life of these dealings with Mr Lowe and his mother demonstrates that you acted fairly and reasonably towards them in a consistent and ethical manner? I think there's been lapses there, and I see again with the impact. It, it wouldn't matter if I thought we had. The impact on the customer has not been acceptable. It matters to me, Mr mm. Carter. Well, I think there's been lapses there. Yes, and in, in those lapses, you did not comply with that obligation under the Banking Code of Practice. Is that right? That would be correct. All right, thank you. I have no further questions for Mr Carter. <coughs> Mr Carter, that's, we've been around the tree several times. Can I just go around it one more time, but with a slightly different uh, uh, approach to it? And we do it in steps. Sure. The FOS determination was the bank should not have made the loan. Step one? Yes. But we agreed so far. Yes. I've done well. Uh, <laughs> step two. Uh, FOS determines that the borrower should be refunded the borrower's outlays for, I think it's only interest or interest and charges yes. that have been uh, accrued in the Since interim exactly. period and should not be charged interest into the future. Step two? Well, since inception, plus the accruals since the complaint commenced. So, so yes. Step two, so yes, far, so yes. good. Step three. And it's step three that I draw particular attention to. It is that regardless of the way the funds advanced may have been applied by the borrower. Yes. The borrower you would say, must either agree within a period of six to 12 months to repay the whole of the principal to the bank. Or enter into or, other arrangements for it, yes. Or yes. renegotiate a new commercial arrangement. Yes. If it pays, if the borrower pays the whole uh, of the principal uh, back to the bank in six or 12 months. The bank is back in the position it would have been had the loan not been made. Uh, yes. But for the time yes. value, which yes. the interest, et cetera, which we have already noted is not to be charged and needs to be repaid. Uh, I agree. Is the difficulty in that that those choices of repay the whole or re renegotiate a new and commercial arrangement to be made regardless of the way the funds may advanced may have been applied in the interim? Uh, I was with you all the way until that last little bit. Yeah. So, I um, thought that's where the, the break was. And I not just, that I don't agree, I just don't quite understand. Sorry. Well, take a business loan. Yes. Shouldn't be made yes. uh, for any of a number of reasons. The business owner takes the funds advanced, pours the funds advanced into working capital for a business that the uh, bank should have recognised was failing. Yeah. And so pours the money out the door uh, in pursuit of a bad business venture. Yes. And the borrower, therefore, has dispersed the funds, dispersed them not uh, uh, by investing on hay burner in the third at Flemington, but by uh, applying them in the business. The position you say that follows is that the borrower then must either pay the whole 
of the amount back or renegotiate a new commercial arrangement to pay the whole back. Is that right? Uh, yes, I believe so. And if there's unfairness, and that's a $64,000 question, if there's unfairness, I wonder whether it is in that step of regardless of the way the funds advanced have been applied, that the bank is kept whole, it gets its money back, but the borrower who has been advanced monies the bank should not have advanced still has to repay. May I offer? Yeah, please. So That's I, why I, I wanted I, to put it to you, so uh, give an answer. <laughs> I, I think this is one where there is not one specific, one way of doing it. And I think there is a continuum here. I, I think where the bank or lender has been grossly negligent it, the, the borrower had honest intent as to purpose. The borrower had honest intent as to the financial data they provided. They thought it was a good business. It actually wasn't a good business. The lender should have known that. That is, that is a, a far more negligent outcome. And therefore, I, I think there should be a greater onus or penalty on the bank or the lender. Uh, then we start moving up. We then have a system, uh, for, for maybe, I don't mean to sound flippant, but where we have a situation where uh, accepting that the bank should have inquired further but was supported in its loss, if I may use those la that language, by, um, by missing, misdeeds, the, the misleading or deceptive conduct by the borrower, either as to purpose or the provision of false financial information. So the bank was tricked almost into advancing the loan. Then there's a shared responsibility there and there needs to be some sort of sharing. And much the, I think the language is contributory negligence, but in a similar fashion, it probably needs to be some sort of sharing uh, of the negative outcome. I think I'd like to believe all of our customers coming to us are honest, honest in intent, honest with their information. If we turn that around and start from a premise that all of our customers are dishonest, that's going to be a very, you know, it's going to make what is currently not a good relationship between banks and the community worse. So uh, I, I guess that's the tension in, in the lending. I think for retail, consumer loans, it's very clearly got to be protective of the borrower. Uh, clearly, when we get to corporate loans, the corporates are at least as sophisticated as the lenders, and, and it's, an equal, it's an equal foot race. But small business is somewhere in the middle here, and it's a question of which way you, you go from the middle uh, as to how, how to resolve this question. Yeah. Ms Orr, is there anything arising out of that? Ms Mitchell, what? Commissioner, I have no questions for Mr Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Carter. Thank you for your evidence. You're excused and uh, further attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, we have one final witness in this case study. I will not be able to finish his evidence today. I wonder if it is better, rather than having him yeah. under cross-examination over the weekend, if we finish slightly earlier and commence his evidence on Monday morning. I'll weep tears of blood if we finish early, Ms Orr, but <laughs> I'll put up with that. Uh, <laughs> How are we travelling generally for time? I think we're fine, Commissioner. That's the best, best assessment. Council was then is. heard to assure the Commission that the timetable was perfectly uh, running according to time. Is that what should I, uh, I should take from not. it? I said nothing certainly of the not. kind, Very Commissioner. Well. Uh, 9.45 on Monday. Thank you, Commissioner.